Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Leah Ma, Leah Ma uh, from the Donders Institute. Um, she did her PhD at the University of British Columbia, uh, working with uh, Jeremy Siemens and Anthony Phillips. After that, she went to Western University working with uh, Stefan Everling, who many of us know. And now, as I said, started off, she's running her own group at the Donders Institute. Uh, she looks at the neural underpinnings for cognitive control processes using rats, macaques, and marmosets, so lots of different uh, preparations, to study how information is encoded by individual neurons, ensembles of neurons, and oscillatory activity within networks of neurons. Um, today, she's going to talk to us about uh, cognitive flexibility from neuron to network. So let's uh, all welcome uh, Dr. Ma. Dr. Ma is a candidate for a membership in the CDR, so we also uh, welcome her in, in that respect. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Rob, for the nice, kind introduction. And I thank you all for the opportunity to present to the CVR audience. Um, so I'll start sharing the slides. Um, actually, perhaps I should do full screen before sharing. Should I? Doesn't matter what you order. Doesn't matter, okay. Yeah. All right, do you all see the slide? Yep. Okay. Um, so, um, I, um, well, uh, for, for those of you who were present at my job talk, this is 90 to 80 percent um, similar to that. And um, at the end, I'll more focus a little bit more on um, the, the plans of studying visual behavior in the marmosets. Uh, so the bulk of my study have been focusing on cognitive flexibility. And um, so I have used a, a number of uh, different species. So these are the common marmoset that you're, you're looking at. And this is what I will be using at York um, as, as the model species. So cognitive flexibility is the, the brain's ability to appropriately adjust behavior according to contextual changes. So for instance, if we want to drive home safely, uh, we have to flexibly, um, I mean, we have to at every uh, travel intersect, uh, traffic intersection, we have to look at the traffic light and decide flexibly. So if we see a green light, then the rule is to proceed with caution. However, if we see the red light, we need to hit the brake in time um, and uh, stop you know, at the, at the right place. So we have to, as we go from travel uh, traffic intersection to intersection, we have to flexibly switch between these rules. So as you can see from this example, that it's flexibility is very important for our safety and well-being. Uh, it is also, uh, it's impairment is, has been that, um, observed in a, a number of psychiatric disorders, such as schizophrenia and uh, bipolar disorder, also um, affective disorders, such as MDD and OCD. So um, as a broad framework of my research pro program, in order to study cognitive flexibility, I uh, use a number of I uh, conduct analyses on a number of levels. So from the single neuron level to the neuronal ensemble level, as well as the extended brain network level. Uh, in, the mean, in the meantime, I also use a number of experimental manipulations. So that could be on one end, um, circuit manipulations such as uh, deactivation or uh, a lesion of a specific region. And uh, on the other hand, it could be using um, pharmacological uh, agents to study the role of neuromodulators such as dopamine. So uh, these manipulations could be conducted using pharmacological uh, tools, but also developmental and optogenetic tools. And uh, in combination with the experimental manipulations, I use high density uh, recording techniques such as neuropixels. Um, so uh, by combining these uh, techniques, um, I, I can uh, really get into the depth and understand uh, the neural mechanisms underlying cognitive flexibility. So um, regarding the model species I, I have used, so uh, there is the macaque monkey, which is um, the dominant and the traditional animal uh, and non-human primate model that has uh, yielded the, the, um, so much knowledge um, in a variety of fields in 
cognitive neuroscience. So we shared a common ancestor with these guys 25 million years ago. With the New World monkey, uh, the, the marmosets, we have shared a common ancestor 35 million years ago. So uh, in comparison to the macaque monkey, these guys have uh, several advantages. So uh, firstly, they have a very small size. So they're actually smaller and lighter than, than rats. And they have a short lifespan and shorter reproductive cycle. And uh, also they are very prolific. So they routinely give birth to twins and even triplets. So that uh, made them especially amenable to uh, the production of trans transgenic strains to model a variety of um, human diseases. Additionally, they have a very rich vocal and uh, social behavior repertoire. And they also, uh, last but not the least, uh, as a great news to electrophysiologists, they have a smooth cerebral cortex. So um, well, as I will uh, get into the details, um, the smooth cerebral cortex, they simply allow you to drop a, a, a linear probe, and then we can simultaneously access all the cortical layers. And that's uh, difficult to do if our region is of interest, uh, is hidden in the sulcus, as is in the case of macaque monkeys or, or for that matter, humans. Um, so here is an example of um, these uh, animals housed in the laboratory. So you can see there's the dad, this is the mom, and these are their babies. And the dad is wearing an implant, and that's quite, that's definitely no problem. Um, he doesn't, I mean, he doesn't attacked by his partner. Um, I mean, they live together happily, I would say. And um, given their small size, we are able to accommodate this family group with a very tall cage. Uh, so there, I would say their uh, welfare is very good as well. So uh, these are some visuals of uh, the size of the brain in these uh, primate species. So in humans, this is a pomelo, by the way. <laughs> in humans, um, out of all these brain regions that are implicated for cognitive control processes, I have focused especially on the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, the posterior parietal cortex, and anterior cingulate cortex. Um, in the macaque monkeys, um, they have homologs, but you can see each of these regions are partially hidden in the sulcus. In the marmoset monkey, they have much smaller brain, um, but the nice thing uh, each of these homolog is um, lying flat on the surface of the cerebral cortex. So that, that um, gives really good, you know, a lot of convenience for uh, an, an electrophysiological recording. So additionally, uh, there is the frontal eye field, which is also implicated in um, cognitive control tasks. This is a relatively recent study um, that I did in the Everling lab. So we conducted simultaneous uh, laminar recording from the frontal eye field, as well as the posterior parietal cortex, the LIP area in the marmosets, uh, while the animals performed a flexible switch between two uh, alternating trial blocks. So in one trial block or under one rule, um, they are uh, expected to make a prosocap. So while they fixate, they notice that this fixation is a, a round dot. That means that once the peripheral stimuli come on and when this fixation dot disappear, they simply make a prosocap towards the big and bright stimulus. On the other hand, uh, in the al alternative trial blocks, if they look at, if they were given instruction as a uh, as a plus sign, then um, when the peripheral stimuli come on, they have to resist the urge of looking towards the big and bright stimulus, and make anti saccade towards the small and um, dim stimulus. So that's a little bit more difficult to do, and uh, which is which is something you can see from the saccadic reaction time, that um, under the prosaccad rule, the correct responses are faster than the errors, which are, in this case, direction errors, uh, meaning that they conducted an um, anti-saccad by mistake. Under the anti scat rule, on the other hand, the correct responses are faster, whereas the errors were, uh, uh, sorry, the correct responses were slower, whereas the errors were faster because these were prosaccads made in, in mistake. So um, the, in terms of the laminar analysis, so why, why do we want to conduct lam laminar analysis? This is because uh, that, as you may know, the upper layer of, of the cortex, the supragranular layers, 
they um, have reciprocal connections with other cortical areas, but not subcortical areas. By contrast, the neurons in the deeper layers, they have reciprocal connections with cortical and subcortical areas. So, um, which demonstrate uh, the fact that these neurons participate in different, um, different circuitry of the brain. So, uh, in the study, we um, analyze the upper layers and deeper layers separately from both FEF and PPC. So in this case, you can see that the neuronal activities are stronger during uh, the instruction period of pro trials than they were during the anti trials. So that um, is um, denoted by the fact that all these dots lie to the right side of the diagonal line. So these neurons indeed uh, were selective for the pro rules. And that's specifically the case for the upper layer neurons in the FEF, which was not the case for deeper layer neurons in the FEF, nor was it the case in upper layer or deeper layer in the PPC. So um, the summary here is that FEF but not PPC neurons in the upper but not deeper layers demonstrated rule selectivity in this task. Um, additionally, once we're able to record many neurons simultaneously, we can conduct um, ensemble level analysis. So in this case, um, if we take a spike train and then um, perform Gaussian convolution and uh, temporal binning, we get a single number here. So each color represents a single uh, firing rate number in the given time bin from one neuron. And if we tile together all these units, so in this case, 18 neurons recorded simultaneously, and if we take a vertical slice here, this one by 18 vector allow us to plot a single dot in the 18 dimensional space, which is uh, reduced to three dimensions here for visualization sake. So each dot here represents entire ensemble's activity in a given moment. So here you can see from moment to moment in this task, this ensemble's activity slowly drifted within this state and then abruptly shifted to a brand new ensemble activity state. So this happened to coincide with a rule switch. So in this old study that I did, um, each black dot here is the entire ensemble's activity state when the animal was pressing on a given lever under the first rule. And each gray dot is the entire ensemble's activity when the animal was pressing on the same lever using the same body posture, however, governed under a, a distinct rule, a second rule. So you can see the entire ensemble's activity would switch, would shift uh, into a, a brand new ensemble state. So the similar um, observation was made in macaque monkeys in the lateral prefrontal cortex. So these red dots were moments, um, the uh, ensemble activities in moments when the animals were um, simply fixating and uh, doing a delay period under the anti rule, whereas the blue dots were um, the same behavior performed uh, when the animal were, was um, governed under the pro rule. So and these analyses were done without screening or um, excluding any neurons. We simply included all the neurons that were simultaneously recorded. So it was basically a random selection of neurons from the brain region of interest. So um, the, the summary here is that rule shifting results in the shift between distinct patterns of activity across randomly selected ensembles of frontal neurons. So that's really interesting because then and that begs the question of what drives such widespread changes across some basically all neurons that were simultaneously active? What orchestrates such um, collective behavior? So um, one possibility was, um, you know, we come back to this um, laminar structure of the cortex. Um, and uh, the, the thinking is that perhaps it is orchestrated by oscillatory activities. And uh, in this case, an alpha beta activity from the deeper layers of the cortex, which is known to be stronger than the alpha beta activity in the shallow layers or supragranular layers. So, um, and other authors studying working memory, they have um, put forward the theory that when one item from working memory has to give way to a new piece of information. Um, so this old item is erased, a new piece of informa information has to come in. Alpha beta activity from deep layers becomes stronger and that drives um, the similar pattern 
um, in alpha activity in the shallow layers, in the upper layers, uh, which in turn entrains um, the gamma activity. So as the alpha activity becomes stronger, gamma activity is antagonistic in, in strength. So it, that becomes weaker. And because gamma activity in turn entrains spiking activity, the spiking activity becomes less locked in phase with gamma activity. Um, so that allows a new piece of information. So the old piece of inf information is now weakened because the neurons um, that encode item A becomes weaker in activity and then neurons that encode information B can now become stronger. So this is their theory. And um, so when I, when I read it, I thought that's a perfect theory for uh, cognitive flexibility as well. So uh, when the old rule becomes irrelevant, perhaps the same mechanism can weaken um, the, the dominance of the irrelevant rule, which now gives way to, to the new rule. So in, um, in this paper uh, that I just showed you, we have seen already that there is evidence in the upper layers neurons encoding the rule. So there, there are, you know, especially in the FEF, the upper layer neurons seem to prefer the prosocat rule. And uh, now we'll look at the oscillatory activity, the LFPs, in both upper and deeper layers in the cortex, in FEF and PPC. So um, here you can see indeed um, in the deeper layers, during the anti saccad trials, the alpha activity was stronger than during the pro saccad trials. And the same pattern was found in the upper layers, even though overall the upper layer activity, uh, upper layer gamma rhythm was weaker than in deeper layers. The opposite pattern was found um, in the gamma, gamma rhythm between 60 and 150 hertz. So here you can see that um, in the upper layers, gamma is stronger than in deeper layers. And also during pro saccad trials, um, gamma was stronger than during anti saccad trials. So that uh, gave uh, evidence to, so here is just a summary, that deeper layer alpha activity was selective for the anti saccad rule, whereas upper layer gamma activity was um, more uh, selective for the pro saccad rule. So you can see that there is evidence for gamma activity being selective for um, a task rule, whereas alpha activity being selective for the opposite rule. So um, I don't have time right now to show you the evidence, but indeed in the same paper, we have presented evidence for the fact that upper layer uh, spiking activity is also modulated by deep layer alpha. And uh, additionally, there is evidence for entrainment. So in this case, it was um, a phase amplitude coupling, coupling between um, upper layer gamma and deep layer alpha activity. So there is evidence of this entrainment being also task relevant or rule, rule sensitive. So taking, going from there, the next step is to find where does that driving force come from? So now we have seen that it is perhaps plausible for oscillatory activity within the local cortex um, to drive the widespread changes in neural activities. But now we don't know where that driving force may come from. So one plausible uh, idea is that it came from network level communication across different brain regions. So that's also an inspiration taken from other uh, literatures showing that um, the same piece of information can be simultaneously identified from several brain regions uh, in the same task. It looks like they're talking to each other um, in real time in every single trial. So that's just a thought. And the goal for my of my research program is to establish causal relations between network level communication and cognitive flexibility. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, sorry, I have to cough again. Um, well, it's a uh, flu season. <laughs> okay, so um, so here uh, <clears throat> from he from now on, I'll come. I'll talk about my res future research plan. So, uh, on one hand, I plan to use this um, task paradigm that is very similar to the one I 
um, described before. The only difference is that the animal now don't have the instruction for the rule. Instead, uh, this is a feedback-based um, task, uh, rule switching task. So they have to discover the rule based on feedback. And um, in this task, uh, I plan to study uh, these brain regions while the animals sit in this head fixed um, preparation. So this setup is very amenable for high density recording using um, uh, uh, linear probes such as the NeuroPixels. So alternatively, uh, <clears throat> it is also um, a very useful design to have a, a training uh, apparatus attached to ooh, attached to the home cage so the animal can train themselves whenever they feel like. So you can see that the animal comes in and um, they put their head up and they lick the tube to get reward and touch the screen to, to select, uh, to make the correct responses. So um, using such a setup, it's um, then in also in combination with a wireless recording system, such as this uh, very lightweight uh, recording system from Spy Gadgets. Uh, it is possible to, um, the plan is to train them on tasks that are slightly more complex. Uh, so for instance, there is a analog to the Wisconsin card sorting task, which is known to be dependent on the lateral prefrontal cortex of, of primate species. So uh, the performance, a performance impairment is also, uh, has also been observed in a number of neuropsychiatric disorders. So specifically, um, this is a attentional set shifting task. So uh, for instance, the animals start um, the day by learning simple discrimination. So in this case, it's a shape rule. So the correct shape would be this speech bubble. Once they, le they learn that, um, they now have another layer of uh, stimuli um, of features uh, over overlaid on top of the shape, um, which is a set of lines. Uh, what they are required to do is to focus on the shape rule and keep choosing the same stimulus. So whether there are white lines, uh, parallel lines, or crossing lines, regardless, the animal had to have to choose um, the speech, speech bubble. So for instance, if they were presented these two stimuli, they have to choose this one. Now, uh, now that they learn the compound discrimination, they um, on certain sessions, they have to learn to do extra dimensional set shifting. So now they have to try to suppress and forget about the shape rule and now focus on the line rule. So perhaps in this case, the correct response would be choosing the crossing set of lines. So if they see these two stimuli, they choose this one. And if they see these two stimuli, they choose this one. So that's, um, they have to ignore the shape and focus on the white lines, as you can see here. On um, other sessions, um, as a control, but also a, an alternative type of um, cognitive flexibility, which engages a different set of brain regions, uh, they may have to learn reversal learning. So in this case, they continue to focus on the shape rule and ignore the white lines. So in this case, the previously rewarded stimulus, which is the speech bubble, speech bubble uh, have to be, I mean, it's it is now unrewarded and they have to select the, the seven pointed star instead. So if they see these two stimuli, they have to choose this one. And if they see these two stimuli, they have to choose this one. And on other, uh, so we could counterbalance the learning process by starting them off uh, on the line rule instead of the shape rule. So using either of these two tasks, um, I could study these set of brain regions by conducting, uh, so as the first part, first part of the research pro program is to really uh, dissect the role of inter-area communication. So in this case, in the control group, if the right LPFC and PPC are inactivated, um, this group of animals I would not expect them to show any deficit in, uh, in either task because they still have an intact LPFC and PPC circuit in the left hemisphere. On, um, on alternative sessions, perhaps the same animal, they could receive reversible inactivation from LPFC on the left side and right PPC. So if one read each of these regions can support uh, this task in isolation, then this animal will not have any impairment in this task or in either tasks. 
However, if LPFC PPC interaction is required, then these animals will be impaired because the right LPFC and the left PPC cannot uh, communicate. So uh, in combination with this manipulation, it will be possible to conduct either acute recording using uh, lambda probes, uh, which in fact, I could conduct a recording in the same region where I will be inactivating. Alternatively, it will be possible to um, insert high density probes in the regions that are intact, that are not being manipulated. And we could study the, uh, the influence of inactivating uh, an, another region to which this region is communicating um, and what kind of influence that, that will have on activity in this intact region. Uh, alternatively, it will be possible to chronically impact, implant um, 3D three-dimensional arrays uh, or other types of arrays like UTA array. Uh, well, um, look at uh, what kind of many what this what influence this kind of manipulation will have um, on uh, neurons. So the summary here is to examine the effect of loss of communication on rule switching and on rule processing in local microcircuits. So as the third part of um, the, the research program is to uh, conduct, is to establish, establish either acute or uh, developmental models. So in this case, an, a potential acute um, disease model was, would be using ketamine. So acute ketamine in healthy humans can trigger uh, the full spectrum of positive and negative symptoms, as well as cognitive impairments that look very similar to patients with schizophrenia. And that, that effect only lasts um, anywhere from half an hour to two hours. So, um, and the same phenomena has been observed in uh, both rodents and macaque monkeys. So in this case, um, in these animals, I could uh, conduct a baseline period of recording in either beha uh, both their behavior and neural activities, inject them uh, systemically with ketamine or saline control and continue to record. Excuse me. Continue to record um, during uh, a test phase or after uh, the switch of, of the rule. Uh, in the meantime, uh, recording can be conducted so that analyses across um, all levels from single neurons to an extended network uh, can be done. And additionally, a pharmacological intervention could be combined with this uh, acute model. So we could test whether compounds such as dopaminergic agents could rescue um, the potential deficits that may be observed in their behavior. So, and the summary here is that we could potentially model pathological changes in rule and set shifting and to examine um, the altered rule or task set processing in both spiking and oscillatory activities across layers. Um, the next part of this program is that it, the possibility of taking advantage of the, the short lifespan of these monkeys and conduct chronic um, studies and analysis of their behavioral performance as well as neural activities um, so it's possible to have a younger cohort, um, so they can live in the lab from a young age until middle age, and, um, and uh, then we could also compare that with an older cohort that live from middle to old age in, in the lab. And uh, again, um, the same recording techniques and manipulations could be done, and um, analyses could be performed across several levels. Um, so. The point here is to examine age-related changes in rule and set shifting and also associated uh, rule task set processing and how that changes um, across layers as well as uh, across multiple brain regions that are part of the, the key network. So um, the last part of the program is to uh, now elaborate and um, establish a neurodevelopmental model for um, schizophrenia and potentially uh, autistic spectrum disorder. So it is well known in the uh, human ep epidemiological studies that um, uh, immune activation during key period of pregnancy later on increases the risk of um, the uh, neuropsychiatric disorders in, in the children. So once they are late adolescent or uh, was in, in their early adulthood, it is, of course, one of many potential risk factors. 
but this paradigm has been established in uh, rats and mice, as well as macaque monkeys, and most recently in, in the marmoset as well. So in this case, the key is to activate um, the mother's immune system using, I mean, scientists have been using a variety of um, different agents. So it could be a, a fake virus, as in this case, the poly-ICLC is a fake virus, uh, but also people have used um, a, 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 a mimic surface protein of a bacteria, like um, lipopolysaccharide. The key here is to, uh, to have the immune system of the mother being activated, and then the signaling molecules such as cytokine and other molecules seems to cause altered development um, in the brain of the, of the fetus, especially the GABA, glutamate, and dopamine systems. So in this model, we would uh, conduct observation from a young age in the offsprings, uh, but also follow them up until they reach adulthood, when we'll start behavioral um, training and testing, and uh, combine that with electrophysiological recording and um, uh, advanced data analysis uh, at multiple levels. And this model could be compared and contrasted with the acute AMD antagonism model. And each model has its advantage and disadvantage. So that would uh, be able to provide us with insight, such as compensatory mechanisms and um, uh, also um, different factors that uh, increase or decrease the risk of, um, of the developmental challenge, such as the, the MIA. So um, this is a summary of the research program. So there are uh, four pillars of this program, uh, but also in the future that in the longer run, perhaps as the transgenic models become available, it is also uh, a possibility of uh, combining these transgenic strains with uh, my existing um, behavioral analyses as well as uh, neurophysiological analyses. So um, this is a slightly newer part. So in the previous talk, uh, during my job talk, I only mentioned of potential um, possibilities of collaborating. Uh, so in several areas, such as comparative uh, studies across uh, visual perception, but also executive functions across marmoset monkeys and macaque monkeys, as well as humans. Um, also eye and motion tracking in free behaving marmosets. Um, so I've done a little bit more thinking on this regard. Uh, I mean, I'm honestly not expert, so this is where I need people to teach me and give me feedback. But the marmosets, um, in many aspects of their visual behavior, they're not really that different from macaque monkeys and, and humans. I mean, admittedly, they make smaller saccades. Um, their saccades are not basically never bigger than 10 degrees. Uh, but you, uh, you, as you can see in this free viewing uh, task, uh, the features that they tend to focus on are not very different. Um, so this is the marmoset visual scan, uh, the scan path. This is the, the macaque monkeys. Um, it's not qualitatively different. Of course, when they're looking at a conspecific, they are um, more focused on, on key features. So, um, I mean, I find the free viewing task uh, interesting uh, is because this is also very relevant to the human condition. So as, um, I mean, this is very well known. So um, people uh, suffering from schizophrenia, they show this very distinct and disrupted pattern of uh, um, the, the scan path in, in the free viewing tasks. So you can see here that they ignore so many features of this image, unlike, the, unlike in the, uh, neurotypical person here, and they, they seem to really spend a lot of time looking at just the few features of the, of the, the bigger image. And they also have other impairments such as fixation, so they have ocular drifts, and they have um, disturbed uh, smooth pursuit as well. So um, actually this pattern is very similar to um, also when uh, healthy people receive uh, acute injection of ketamine. So they, they have uh, disrupted um, the scan path as well. And they also have things like ocular drift. So in fact, the ocular drift was also observed in uh, macaque monkeys. So I kind of expect that there is a possibility of um, finding similar patterns in uh, marmosets once they receive acute ketamine injection. And um, I 
think that that could be a potential uh, additional behavior to study uh, once I establish this uh, acute disease model. And additionally, in patients, it is also well known that they, um, especially to, to a, a face stimulus, they have disrupted um, a scan pattern so, or, or fixation and saccade pattern. So they tend to um, fixate on just one feature and also um, not looking at all the important features of a face, and they seem to have uh, disrupted configurable processing um, of, of a face. So that makes me think of the possibility of modeling this deficit in, in, the, in the primates. So indeed, um, oh, also, it, yeah, I forgot to mention that healthy people with a uh, ketamine challenge also display a similar pattern as um, observed in patients with schizophrenia. So there is a, a recent study uh, in the marmoset monkeys uh, looking at uh, their scan path when they are looking at conspecific faces. So the, the key the key finding is here. Um, these are so these arrow demonstrate uh, the num the percentage of total saccades that originated from the left eye and ended on the right eye, and these um, these are saccades that that were were the opposite. After ketamine injection, and the animal basically stopped making saccades between uh, across the two eyes, so back and forth. Instead, they made a lot of saccades that um, originated and ended within a feature. So for instance, the left eye, the right eye, and also within the snout. So you can see in the, as in the, these per percentages increased um, for each of the features. So um, the idea is that they seem to have disrupted configurable processing or holistic processing, if you wish, uh, of conspecific faces, um, uh, which resembles the deficit observed in patients. So uh, I want to mention here that um, marmosets are also a, a very good species to study this because, for instance, in the macaque monkeys, they um, sometimes would have a gaze aversion if, I mean, in the, in the natural setting, a subordinate macaque are not expected to um, look at the, the dominant the dominant monkeys in, in the eyes, uh, otherwise it's perceived as a challenge. Whereas the marmosets don't quite have that and they enjoy very much looking at conspecific faces. Uh, so this is very natural behavior. Um, and um, so that's why I think that um, perhaps this also could be another behavior of interest, um, whether to analyze in um, healthy monkeys or um, in the disease model scenario. Um, so last but not the least, I mean, this can go pretty far now. So this is to do with uh, facial expressions. So um, I'm also new to this, but I find it really fascinating that um, uh, patients, they have the def deficit looking at different types of faces with different facial expressions, but they seem to have, um, this also seem to interact with the expression. So in this case, when looking at the happy face, they seem to be actually more impaired when compared to when they look at the sad faces. So they seem to scan a little bit more um, across multiple features. So the marmoset monkeys do have facial expressions. Uh, it's not terribly well studied yet. There, there, are, there were maybe three, four studies um, that uh, have tried to catalog their facial expressions. So, so these are the positive facial expressions. Um, like um, lip, uh, lip licking and you know lip curling in this case. This is neutral. So you can see that these are um, more negative uh, facial expressions. So I, I haven't seen a, a sad or uh, angry face of marmoset being characterized yet, but uh, that's certainly a possibility. And um, so th the idea is that uh, it may be a possibility to see if marmosets scan different facial expressions differently um, when they when they are presented uh, with these stimuli and allowed to uh, freely scan and um, how a challenge such as acute dopamine or uh, a developmental disease model may interact with um, their uh, visual scan of the facial expressions. So uh, this is the I mean this is my um, the framework, my research program slide, but with a slight modification. So to broaden my focus on cognitive flexibility, 
I believe that it will be possible to look at a bigger variety of species appropriate visual behaviors in the marmosan monkeys that are relevant to the human condition. Um, so I thank you very much for your attention. And uh, these were my past and current collaborators. And these are my past and current affiliations um, and funding bodies. So thank you very much.